Councillor Vorster. Um, we've got no apologies for today. We've got a full complement of member councillors um, and we welcome our Deputy Mayor, Councillor Gates, and yeah. Councillor O'Neill from the Deep South. Um, yeah. <laughs> 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 Some people actually go off when they have a haircut. Okay. Um, confirmation of uh, minutes. I'm um, moved. Moved. Thank you, Councillor Owen Jones. Seconded by Councillor Taylor. All those in favour? That is carried. Um, what are you doing? I don't believe we have any conflicts of interest to date, unless there's any from the floor today. No, that's good. Um, we've got uh, the agenda in front of us. We've got 5.1, which is starred, 6.2, 6.3 and 6.4 are starred. Did we want to unstar anything there? Moved. So that's moved. Uh, Councillor Vorster, second to Councillor Caldwell. Mm. All those in favour? Oh. Page 43, um, you'll see the di divisional listings, and one of them for Division 5, the third, fourth one down is a pedestrian ascot in Varsity Lakes. Well, that could be your so is a wrongful <coughs> error a is double oh. negative? Yeah. So it's mm. correct. It's, so there's an, error, an error in there, and, and you're paying for something in Varsity Lakes, so well, you're very generous. There, <laughs> <laughs> and at Frascott Park, too. <laughs> So subject to the deletion of yes. that or the yeah. okay. correction of that by the officers, I'm happy to move the well, item. And... <coughs> yep. So if that's the only correction, yeah. councillors, um, that'll be moved by Councillor Vorster, second um, by Councillor it's... Caldwell. All those in favour? That is carried. Yeah, yeah. Um, councillors, that leaves us with 6.1, which is Gold Coast Road Safety Plan 2126 update. And I believe we've got a presentation. And the officers are going to join us now. Thank you, Chair. I, I might introduce the team as they're coming in. So, um, uh, many of you may be aware, next week is actually Road Safety Week. Mm. Um, and certainly, I think it's special budget. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we started having a, 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 a relatively robust conversation relating to pathway safety. So the road safety plan um, is now at midpoint. Um, it has a number of ongoing as well as new initiatives. And um, today's presentation and report are ideally about um, informing um, councillors on where we're up to so far, um, and also starting to get a bit of a sense check about some of the um, new initiatives that are underway, um, noting that in the recommendations there is obviously a recommendation to come and work with you as the next stage of that already, but we felt it was worthy to have uh, that conversation. Um, so presenting um, this afternoon is Deva from the road safety team. He's been at council for about six months now. He is an expert in this space and he's going to take us through the presentation. And it's his first time presenting here at council as well. So. so we're going to be kind and we're going to let him get through the whole presentation oh. and we're going to write our questions down, please. Happy days. And welcome back to the Gold Coast. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Is that on? Yep. So good afternoon, Chair, uh, Director, uh, fellow councillors and colleagues. Uh, it's nice to be here. I was here 23 years ago in the traffic branch, so it's, uh, I remember a few faces, but it's just nice to be back in a different capacity. <laughs> no, no offence. <laughs> no, so, so it's uh, just a very, very quick, um, very quick presentation on uh, the road safety plan, which um, is about a year and a half into its life. It's uh, a 21 to 26 uh, road safety plan. Uh, about 50 actions out of the plan and what I present to you is an amalgamation of about 
30, 35, 40 actions in, in different packages, and we'll just pick out the highlight, the strategic ones that I want to present. So as uh, the director said, my name's Deva, Deva Nyker. I'm the coordinator of the road safety team. I've spent, um, my background is road safety and traffic engineering, so 20 years in the road safety space and another nine or 10 in the traffic engineering, so well across this space, and I helped a lot developing, a little bit developing this plan as well in my other capacity. So, slide one. What do I press this little button here? All right, go. So the presentation's about um, the current initiatives, initiatives that we're doing and where we are at, at that, and there's some, some really good work happening in the background, and a quick presentation on some of the new um, initiatives or the new projects that we're uh, challenging to undertake. So uh, in no particular order, um, and I'll just go through them, and you've seen them in your presentation, no particular order. The first one's about the drive safe speed awareness sign, the said, said, smiles, uh, said smile signs. Generally very successful across the city. Uh, we've got uh, 104 of them in different um, locations throughout the city, and they rotate every four, four months. And that information of speed data comes back to you, and we hope to improve that a little bit better in coming in the next round. We have um, six signs, six of those modified signs along the ocean way. As you come into the uh, more um, people places areas, the more activity areas. And we have, I think, the remaining four in the wildlife areas, so Kurumban, Tingtali Valley, and there's one up at Kumara. So, so the wildlife team and those, uh, that group is managing that, but we've helped them set up. And they've been fairly effective as well. So this um, smiley face, uh, that collects speed, speed data, time of the day. And uh, there's a lot of information it, it does take, but it's actually quite good. Generally, there's about a um, seven, six, seven percent speed drop in the first month or so, four weeks, and then it creeps up to about four percent compliance, and then it eventually, you don't get any compliance after a short uh, span of time. The second one's about our VMS, the portable VMS signs on the right-hand side. They're, uh, they're mobile, and um, the whole idea with that is to um, portray uh, road safety messaging. So it's um, distracted driving, the fatal five um, pathway stuff. Uh, could be speeding, it could be uh, Easter road safety campaign, Christmas, that sort of um, messaging. They are, re they are relocated uh, throughout the city, and finding spots, safe spots for them um, are a bit of a challenge because of vandalism and theft, stealing tires. So we just got to be very careful where there's our CCTVs and all that. So we're learning as we go. We have um, seven, five of them are in, the, in my team, and two are with road operations. That, so they're to do with, um, so you know how when we uh, put signals at a new intersection, they actually monitor the intersection to see if it's working or anything needs to be tweaked. The rest of ours, they have CCTVs, ours don't have CCTVs and ours don't have any speed radar, it's just messaging, so we can remotely chain messages. They're used for major road incidents, so the helicopter incident, uh, two of ours were used when the roads were closed, and during disasters, so road closures during, road, uh, during the disaster incident management time, so they're quite, they're quite good. Crash Investigation Alliance, um, this is, um, We've put it up there because the crash investigation is, a, this alliance is a formal relationship we have with TMI and Queensland Police. So when there's a fatal crash in the city, we normally get notified and there's a time frame to uh, activate an investigation into the, into the crash, why the crash happened, any causal factors. So we look at, um, council looks at the engineering aspect to see our, our, um, our vulnerability, if there's any deficiencies on the road network and the police actually look at the enforcement and prosecution, so there's the two meet together. Uh, our job is to uh, find out what went wrong, uh, if the signage was good, the road was good, and part of that is to also, um, what I hope to do is to take the, the councillors on a journey as well, uh, keeping them up to date or informed when the, a significant crash happens. The support and education side of things, um, that's an ongoing thing that um, uh, our, my team does. It works in with um, the national campaigns such as um, National Road Safety Week, which is the 14th to the 21st, um, it's a national one around Australia. 
the Fatality Free Friday, which is the last Friday in May to have a zero fatality on the day throughout Australia. So there's a lot of work that goes on. And over time, I hope uh, to get a bit more engagement between yourselves and my team so that we're out there having the same message. The Queensland Road Safety uh, Week is a big one in Queensland. It's the end of August. It's a whole week of road safety fix, uh, festivities. And it normally ends up with a, a big, uh, some sort of expo, or some activation in a part of the city. And I think we, with COVID, everything went hiatus a little while, but hopefully that's back on, back to, back to it again. The Rural Road Safety Week, uh, which is normally in October, and it leads into the Christmas Road Safety Campaign. That is targeting our rural hinterland areas uh, where there's still lots of crashes, uh, off-road crashes, so that's a different type of crash treatment as opposed to the urban ones. The partnership, the road safety, the PAG, uh, a very important part or the core part of the road safety program. So this is the partnership that we live and breathe um, with, within our internal council teams. Also with um, transport and main roads. So transport and main roads have the road safety team, they have the compliance team, and um, they have um, the policy side of things, which is like the personal mobility devices, the lines, signs, the standards. Uh, Queensland Police are very involved in that as well, as well as uh, Griffith University, RECQ, CASQ, <coughs> and we also talk to our neighbouring councils to share what we have or what they have, and often it's a common goal because uh, the road network is one network. You know, if you're driving from here to the Tweed, it's the same, or here to Logan, it's the same. But the rules might be different, the signage might be different. So it's an important part. We meet every quarterly, and um, it's, been, it's been good. But operationally, we are talking all the time. Some interesting ongoing uh, new initiatives here is, one is um, the high activity um, speed limit reviews that we recently undertook. So these are the 30 and 40 K signs in uh, areas like Broadbeats, parts of surface, and I think there's other areas, Southport as well, uh, where we've reduced the speed down to 30 and 40, and they're more to address um, or improve the safety of vulnerable road users. Uh, it's more about that. Uh, and it's, uh, it was funded by, um, by, by Transport and Main Roads under a, a road safety high vulnerable road user funding program. So it was a lot of uh, urban councils in Queensland that took up the challenge and I think been quite successful. Uh, I understand that our team or our traffic engineering side of our team is doing further uh, reviews or looking at other areas that could be looked at as well so that our community is better looked at. Now this is an interesting one, the PMDs, the personal mobility devices. This has taken a lot of our time. This is new to all of us especially uh, with the legislation or the new legislations and how we sign it and how we mark it and how we collect data and all that. All that. So November 1st last year, 20, uh, 2022, TMR introduced speed limits to uh, personal mobility devices. These are scooters, electric scooters, skateboards, electric skateboards, bike, e-bikes, all that sort of stuff. And there was obviously a discrepancy between the speeds, traveling speeds of them is you and I walking with our families along the ocean way or somewhere and then someone's flying through it 30 kilometers an hour. So someone had to put some regulation into that. So this has come in, there's some rules, some very default statewide rules on speeds on bikeways, which is the 25 and on roads. And the road is defined as, a, in this case, as, a, as an unmarked road under, in a 50 zone or less. And then riding on a pathway, footpath or ocean way sort of uh, system where it's 12. So um, the compliance of this thing has been challenging and um, the radar, the police who do the enforcement, I'll go to my next slide just to make that clearer. On the right hand side, it's the police who enforce speed limits. Um, they are grappling with the technology of detecting lower speeds. So um, it's that LIDAR or radar that they use needs to be able to collect lower speed. 25 is all right. It's the environment of the 12K that's the issue that we are, I think, facing with. Um, I understand they are being trained and they tried it in Brisbane. They have tried it on the Gold Coast uh, for some successful um, outcomes with that enforcement. So that's sort of happening. Our role is provide the hardware, the, the construction maintenance to the landmarking, the signage, uh, where necessary undertake speed limit reviews um, and the education and marketing campaign. So 
those VMSs that I spoke about earlier, some of it's used, will be used for VMSs, so helmets on, no double riding, no phone in the hand, that sort of stuff. Um, and that's in conjunction with the campaigns the state's doing, TMR's doing through the street smart stuff. So the Department of Transport Main Roads is basically all about defining um, what the devices are, what classification of the devices, uh, identifying the road rules that apply. That's the 20 and, um, the, sorry, the 25 and 12, and uh, determining the criteria where they're used and the regulatory signage and line marking that's necessary for this. So it's still, we're all working together to have one outcome, which is the safety of our community, and um, we're still in that space. So having spoken about that, there was, um, a report that we were doing uh, on pathway safety and conflicts, and we are hoping to finalize that report by the end of July. And that has a lot of data. We're just waiting for some last bit of data to come through. But that actually shows um, areas in where they are speeding, areas where we have deficiencies on our, on our network, and it could be segregated laneways or places where they're wider and they're all traveling together, or they're commuting from home to work, or places outside uh, surf life clubs and those activity areas where there's lots of conflicts. So we've got our minds set on some ideas and how they work, what works, what doesn't work, and what sort of signage works. So with the pathway saf uh, safety um, study, um, that has a um, couple of other road rules. And so now that it is part of the road rules, all the drink driving, all those speeding, mobile phone offenses now uh, are effective. So that's the enforceable side of it. Speed stuff of it still being looked at by QPS. But um, currently we've had, you would have noticed, um, we've got a combination of signs, we've got a combination of um, those sad signs as you come into it, areas, combination of um, green threshold markings. They all have different impacts on different people and we haven't quite got to the demographics of ages, but they have a big, I think it's because when you're riding or walking, you're only looking at this peripheral vision so you're not looking at something over there, you're looking at something on the ground. So we're finding that the green markings and some of the lane markings are generally working, but we are using some smart technology to work out if there are conflicts. So say, not keeping left, all that sort of stuff. Or someone rings the bell and suddenly you turn around onto the on oncoming cyclist. That's what's causing the injuries. So that report's coming end of July, so hopefully we have a, a, uh, um, a stand on that at some point. Then segue to the next one, how we get some of the data is a um, predictive crash analysis tool. So that's using CCTVs that have inbuilt um, artificial intelligence, some AI. So using for two things. One is um, on um, pathways. So you, can, you can't work out the speeds, but you can work out if they're not keeping left or they're, not, they're overtaking people or they're approaching too fast. It'll work out that and give you little heat maps like the picture on the right where the conflict side, so it'd be two seconds to a collision or a second to a collision. So it gives us an idea of where to concentrate or make some improvements. It's also used for intersections. So um, where right turns are or just a four-way intersection and you're deciding whether to put a roundabout or a set of signals or just some stop signs, that'll tell you what is probably the issue. And so rather than going and wasting time, you could, you could narrow in. Very useful, that's an example down at Palm Beach. Um, I think it was a post black spot treatment, so it still had a few little issues down there. Uh, and, but it's used um, all over. Um, we're one of the few councils that use it fairly extensively. And we've helped with the development of this AI to suit us, so I think we're the only council that's using it for pathways, not for motor vehicles. So Brisbane, we're ahead of Brisbane. Brisbane don't use it on there, they're only using it for it's a bit of a race happening between us offices, but no, no, it's, it's a, no, well, it tells you the time of collision, so you just gotta read, it's like a grain of salt. You have to work out, okay, they, they were, the chances that they're gonna collide, but they haven't, and if they collided, then, then what? What do we do? I know, it's a race. Oh, there's always a race with us and them. Always a race. Another interesting one is, um, uh, the 50k bin stickers. Uh, we did a bit of a trial in Councillor Young's area in Division 5. Um, different combinations of rules, you know, the different volumes of traffic and all that. Basically, in a nutshell, what it was, and 
lots of councils have done that, and I think they've all come to the same conclusion, that it feels good, the people love it, and uh, well, it doesn't work. <laughs> the speeds are still the same. But uh, there must be some impact, something there. I think, um, so what we're looking at is a, a forward plan of maybe producing, that's standard MUTCD, the standard regulatory sticker. Looking at something that's uh, more, uh, some, you know, that has to be installed by an officer, something that's installed by a resident. You could give it out to your residents during your stalls and uh, with some instructions put it up. Just go slow in my street or something. We're working, we're working with Councillor Young and we'll have a chat on that on the side. And um, comms is a major part of it, the road safety communication. So we have an approved uh, communication marketing strategy, a three year plan that allows us to um, uh, do uh, campaigns, so we have some, we have some unique things like uh, multilingual uh, readings and messaging with our international visitors who, who ride a bike but don't appreciate the rules that we have, that sort of thing, simple. Uh, riding, hiring, hiring equipment and all that. So um, that communication with pedestrian safety, with um, cycling safety, with general road safety is rolled out continually, so um, um, that's, that's a good space to be in. I think it's front foot forward. I think I've got two more. So the Seniors Travel Guide, I'm sure you're all very familiar with that. Um, very popular booklet, little booklet of 23, 24 pages. Has a lot of information on travel, phone numbers, um, where to get from A to B and all that sort of stuff. The good thing is um, you can carry a, a, a like an A5 copy in your purse or in your handbag, or you have electronic version or something on your phone, but it's a lot of information. You get a lot of requests for reprints for that, so it's just good. The enhanced school zone sign. <laughs> um, and health, these are the ones with the speed cameras. So, so um, the, state, the state manage the enforcement side, like they do with the red light cameras and the mobile cameras. The state manages the enforcement side there's a mix of uh, flashing zone signs that are owned by the state and owned by, by council. We have two, uh, so there are 24 trials of sites looked at throughout Queensland. We've got two sites um, in, on the Gold Coast, um, one in Talabajra Valley Road, uh, St. Andrews School, and um, the other one was at um, Coomera up at um, Picnic Creek Road, of Amity Road. So um, there are the two sites. Uh, the data is being collected. They haven't, haven't started enforcing it yet. It's just uh, getting the technology right. Uh, it's the same as doing mobile phone cameras. They have to get the technology right first. I think July 1st is when they go live. So um, they are giving you reminders saying you were caught doing 43 in a 40 zone, all that data. So just getting that, yeah, all, I mean, you know what I mean? 47 or whatever it was, whatever the threshold is. Yeah, and getting the time right, uh, not issuing fines on a public holiday, uh, NZEC day it might go off, you know, that, the little things like that. I don't like it being on the school zone signs. I do. Their infrastructure. There's no excuse for speeding. No, no excuse. Zones. There's a lot of uh, evidence. They're probably our most <laughs> vulnerable just... environment. And, uh, you know, there's other, other campaigns in other, other places that have a uh, very strong emphasis on speeding awareness around school zones, and this is a good, probably a good thing. And if you speed, not in a, yeah, it is, but not in a school zone, they're, they're very vulnerable, these young kids, if they get hit. So we've got two, so yeah, watch this space. It's a voluntary scheme. It's voluntary, yeah, you go under 40, you're fine. So I think that's, that's my presentation. I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions. I'm going to field the first one and then I'll, I'll work down um, or backwards this time. I'll start at 14 and we'll work back here, the other here, way for a change. Deep south. Yes. Um, my question is, um, and it comes back to um, the um, policing of the, the um, 12K an hour and all that sort yep. of stuff, I know, um, and the director and I have had a chat about it, you know, how many infringements have actually been issued here on the Gold Coast already, but my, my I guess, inquiry is I'd like to know where, because Councillor Taylor quite often has an issue with this, as do a couple of other areas, the speeding of the scooters and all that sort of stuff. 
how relative that is to where the hire shops are. Because I would imagine, because Surface Paradise is full of hire shops, yep. that that is where they're going to speed because that's where they're getting their um, uh, getting their scooters from. Scooters. And then the other, back to what you said, if they're hiring equipment, these shops or these businesses should be responsible for yep. um, make uh, some way of making them aware of. What, what you were saying, our traffic rules are. If you're here from, there's 10 of you here from Brazil and you're doing all of these and you've hired it and you're really good at it, but you don't know what our road rules are, yep. then it, it puts the public at a vulnerability. <coughs> so I was just wondering, it's like, and I'm sure Councillor um, O'Neill has it as well, um, and potentially <coughs> in Southport as well, where there's a lot of hire shops. And can is there some way we can incorporate where the bikes are hired from, like a safety message or an education yep. leaflet or something like that. So if you're riding your um, personal mobil mobility device within our city, these are the rules. And yes, we've signed off. We've been given that. Off you go. But okay. It's... So there's probably a two-part answer for that, okay. and I hopefully have both. Uh, mm. One is um, the hired scheme, the, the, the hire from mum and dad shop down at the surface, right? Um, all those operators, or as much as that have been identified, have been spoken with, spoken to by either Queensland Police and or Transport and Main Road. So there are compliance officers that go and there's a business card that has a QR code on it, has all the road rules. Uh, I, can, I can send them to your offices, but they, have the, they are given that when they hire their bikes. And they're also given their responsibilities and what to remind the riders and to give this business card and to remind them of the helmets of speed and all those eight or ten new road rules. So that's, that part is happening. Whether those hirees or people who hire those bikes wish to adhere to that, that's, that's, another, that's another thing. So the challenge we have, and I've been in this space for over 18 months in this PMD space, so the last six months has been here, is um, a lot of those hired ones uh, they, uh, they haven't got governors, they didn't have governors for speed. So, for example, um, they could still travel at 25, 30, 40, because you want, you want, to, you want to go clappers on them. They, that's what they hire them for, especially the young ones doing schoolies. So it's become mandatory now to have a certain amount of wattage uh, on those, on this 250 watts or 125 watts, depending on what, what you're hiring, so they can only do a certain speed. So that is starting to happen as they're getting the new scooters in and they don't import them in. Now the other challenge, the big challenge we have is, and, and just going back, um, there is some data now collected by the hospitals on the, the, the admissions to hospitals. So Gold Coast, Robina, a couple of them in Brisbane, Logan, are starting to collect this through a collective uh, means. And what sort of bike they're riding, how do they fall off, who owns the bike, what's the, what's the ownership of the bike, what type of bike. So the ones that are the hired ones um, have lower, lower crashes, lower injuries. The ones we're having some serious issues in speeding and all that are the ones that you and I own privately. They're the ones you can tweak and, and uh, get those speeds up if you know how to do that. So they're the ones um, that are still out there. And um, the import, import rules are changing, but I think it'll take a while before that stock runs out and uh, they're the ones involved in the high injury crashes. So it'll, we're probably in the space of transition, and at some point we'll do that. Now, in Brisbane and in Logan, we've been tracking the Hyatt schemes, the, the beams and the yellow, the limes and all that. They're actually very low injury because if you start speeding or driving dangerously, it shuts you off, it cuts off. So there's three different things we need to look at. The one we need to target really from our city's end is um, Yes, the hired ones, the older bikes and scooters, and the ones that are owned by mum and dad. So the young kids, you know, they fly through this at high speed. They're the ones causing dramas. So how we, how we engage with them, whether it's through schools or education, through active travel, through our active travel program, that's the challenge we have for the next generation. You know, it's, it's going to take eight, ten years to get through that. Thank so you. hopefully that's, I've answered that. Yeah, that's been great. So, Councillor O'Neill, did you have any questions? Thanks, Chair. Um, yes, I am having a huge problem in uh, Division 14. Um, I think what I'm not seeing in their report, and I know that there's another report coming in July, is the headway we've made with TMR and QPS about 
I know the responsibility is theirs to police it, but they're not doing that at the moment, I can assure you of that. Um, because they are understaffed. They, they, there's, it's, it's just about impossible for them to police this at the moment unless they put on more staff or they, you know, they redirect their staff. But I think what's... Have we come to some agreement with TMR and QPS about what sort of signage is required and, and, and what time frame are we looking at it going up? Because I notice there's just in the, in the recommendations is that our Mayor write to um, the state government saying, you know, we need some direction on this. And was, we're, we're a long way down the track yep. of, of having a, a shared pathways and electric devices. Yes, I know it's only been since November last year with the speed limit, but there, there's a real chance that there's, there's actually going to be a serious, really, I mean, there's accidents all the time, yep. but I mean, a really serious um, accident in one of our divisions where council is going to have to wear this. We're moving way too slow. And there's no criticism of you or the, or the officers, but, but surely TMR and QPS, I just want to know where we've actually got with them. So just, uh, just a verbal update uh, on that QPS. And so it's a good, very good question. And the councils have been asking that as well. So the situation with uh, QPS, if they've got a lot of their officers now trained to do the low speed, low speed enforcement. So what we've been working on the coast is uh, trying to identify locations, especially along the ocean, where we can they can pull them across, pull them over, or st stop them, but on a sa in a safe area. So it's trying to identify those identify those locations and also identifying where speeding is occurring. So we've got the data where speeding is generally occurring or at higher levels. It's then um, getting them off the road onto a safe place. But the last thing you want is a copper to a police officer to st uh, stop them and they're booking them or having a chat with them on the roadway. The other challenge uh, QPS have is uh, when they pull over to issue a fine, you need to have an address. So they could give, they could give a wrong name and a wrong address if they don't have a driver's license. And that is, that is, a, that is a, a challenge to them as well. So they can not pull up an adult because they'll carry some form of ID. Uh, but a young, you know, what do, what do you, how do you find, give a $300 fine to a young kid not mm. wearing a helmet? You just got to have a yeah. chat with them, you know, kind of thing. But the... So that's the challenge uh, we're having. Brisbane has been trialling now successfully with the enforcement side of things. So there's some safe pullover areas or wider footpaths or little side uh, things. So it's mostly in the South Bank Goodwill Bridge area. I understand we did a, a trial run in the Broad Beach area, but I think uh, we are grappling with locations, safe locations to do that enforcement. So um, that's something we've started. Um, and that's the space we're in. TMR have just given, this is 12, this is 25, go for it end of the day, we live with the challenge of what we're going to provide as an infrastructure or what sort of signage we'd provide, if we can. And QPS have the challenge of pulling someone over and having a, a decent chat with them or giving them a fine. But I'm, I'm just saying the, the signage, the, the signage about the speed limit probably is really important because if they're going to pull someone over, I mean, I know ignorance is no, is no excuse, but yes, yeah, yeah. signage is really important. Yeah. The other thing, I, and, and I appreciate everything you're saying, it's, it's very difficult. Um, there's only one other thing I wanted to bring up, and it was one of your slides, and I've had a, a complaint um, through my division just recently about the, the signage trailers virtually being in a bike lane. But I get that yes. you did make the, the point about how, you know, it is a challenge to find safe yes. places to put those trailers. But you, on your slide, it actually showed that. And I, I, I think that might have even been Golden Drive. the same one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. through the chair. Just, yeah, the, the positioning of our trailer for enforcement. So the challenge I have is um, finding a spot for the trailer that has to be on the road and not on a footpath so someone would collect into it. But at the same time, a rider would see that message. So a lot of it's about the default messaging, default speed limits, uh, which we're really trying to get out there. And what the police are trying to do is to just give out this um, business cards that has all the speed limits and all that in there. So we're learning as we're going through and appreciate any feedback. So we can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Your area is a bit of a challenge. It's a high use area. So a lot of, yeah, it's always challenging. <laughs> That's it, Councillor O'Neill. Yeah, good. Councillor Vorster. Uh, 
<laughs> Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, just a few very quick questions, um, but I just want to preface that by reflecting on, I suppose, Council's hesitancy in supporting a trial of an e-scooter rental scheme. As I said, or as I have said in earlier debates, I think that has actually been the missed opportunity to have a safe rollout of technology on the coast, because plainly there's demand for these scooters, it's going nowhere, and because we don't have a rental scheme where we can work with a provider to geofence areas and stop them from running or to lower their speeds remotely, people have purchased equipment and you can download updated firmware from the internet and you can override any speed limitation mm -hmm. that might have been required on import. Yep. And so it's not a black market, it's people acquiring these devices privately, but because we've given them no alternative but to do that, we've foregone the opportunity to, yep. to have a safe role, and I think that's a pity. Um, now that we've got them, I, several questions, but from time to time I've raised councillor requests to have almost lane designations put on shared paths, encouraging people to stick to the left while walking or using their scooter and their bike. And the advice from city officers to me is that that's actually not a, you know, desirable or vogue way of doing it. Some of that signage has actually been sort of ground off the footpaths and we've replaced it with signage every few hundred metres which says, you know, share the path. I don't think the signs even say keep left. Um, I just wondered whether there was a regulatory reason why we're not trying to create lanes on our wider shared paths, because for me that's a, an obvious safety step that we could be taking. Thank you, Councillor. Through the Chair, just some quick ones. The, the matter of um, rental e-scooter, I'll leave it with the Director. Sure. No, that's no. another conversation. No, no, for and another... you don't need to respond to that. <laughs> yes, I just we have to... a Council resolution that says that we cannot yes. introduce one, so yes. unless Council determines otherwise, that's, yeah. that's the position. Yep. The other two, the lane designation um, is a good one. Um, so that um, slide that I had with the heat maps, that has picked out a number of locations where we've had uh, conflicts where it clearly says keep left. So all, all users keep left and all that. So people are overtaking and all that. So we've identified areas. Now it could be deficiencies, deficiencies in the network, so the width of the footpath. At that time when we built the footpath many years ago, it met the criteria. Uh, today it doesn't. So you could just imagine uh, the M1. Uh, 20 years ago it was four lanes, two, two plus two, now it's four plus four. Volume's grown. COVID's changed the way sure. we do things. Uh, there's a lot more people on the road walking, cycling. Bikes uh, and the scooters are the same. Everyone's import, you can import them through eBay. So a lot of people are getting that. The, the, so that's the signage. So it's compliance with the signage is a little bit of an issue. Oh, so, Madam Chair, through you to our city officers, I guess what I'm trying to understand is where is that criteria? Are there internal policies to us or are there state regulations that we now defer to which requires to remove these? Yeah, through the Chair, we do have an internal policy document and it relates to the width of the path. So once you get down too narrow, it actually gets a little bit safe to unsafe to segregate them, but I can talk to you about that document offline if you Yeah, like. look, th that'd be good because I think when, like, like I mean, Councillor Hamill will know this with all of his paths to nowhere, um, <laughs> footpaths, <laughs> fo fo <laughs> footpaths are core business for Council. They are core business, right? So roads, roads, rubbish and footpaths. And whenever there are changes on the footpath network or the way people use them, um, we get a lot of feedback as councillors. And so if there has been an internal policy change, it'd be useful if that is socialised with us as councillors because people do have questions. It impacts them on their daily commute or their daily yep. walk. Yep. And if we're not aware of the justification for that, it can be somewhat embarrassing when it's raised at a community meeting, which is yep. why I'm raising it now. But that's all good. That's good no, background. That's taken on board, yep. Um, with this, 
with the speed awareness devices. Sorry, can I just um, add something to that, please, through you, Chair, to, to the councillor? So I think um, if, I'm, if I might just add, um, in terms of the resolutions, um, one of the things that we've been working on, and it, it's safe to say the team have been doing a lot of research and a lot of intelligence and a lot of fact-finding over the last six months, and certainly since the, re the regulation has changed, is that they've realised that not there's not a single fit-for-purpose treatment for our shared pathways, and as we know, those closer to higher um, shops have different issues potentially to others. So ultimately, as we're now into the solution mode, that's absolutely why the resolution is about coming and talking to you each individually about what are those impacts, particularly in your area, and what are the treatments that may or may not work, because certainly there isn't definitely a single way that we're going to resolve these issues across the city. So um, that, that's the part that's to come. Today was really about what have we got done so far. Sure. Next stage is, is to talk to you about what are those treatment looks like, and then making sure we We've got that information. So, Madam Chair, I've just culled a whole bunch of questions, so I'll just keep it really brief from here on out. Um, just on the bin stickers, that whole project really, really, really intrigued me because in my neighbourhood, in the centre south of the Gold Coast, um, there are a number of wheelie bins out in the road reserve that have slowed down or they even have the speed on the, on the bin yep. with an old City of Gold Coast logo. So what was intriguing to me is that we've gone through the, the hard work of doing this trial and looking at it from a regulatory point of view and this, that and the other, but we've previously, as a city, sponsored quite a similar program. And that was a little bit frustrating to me because when I saw what was being rolled out in Division 5, I thought it would have been great to increase the size of the, I suppose, the sample to see whether we might have actually got a favourable outcome, which might not have been reflected in Division 5. But I'm happy to accept that it doesn't work. Um, one thing I have suggested when we last considered the road safety plan and the bin sticker trial was that there are some bin stickers that show a little boy or a little girl running into the road as if they are catching a ball, trying to get a ball in the road. So it's not a speed sign, but it creates that kind of apprehension as a driver that, oh, hang on a second, there might be a vulnerable road user about to dart in front of me. And to me, that is something that we should be looking at rather than dismissing stickers altogether. I know the state government, not to heap praise on them, but they've got those like yellow core flute cutout people yeah. that they place along the M1. For me, the kids on the wheelie bins are kind of our equivalent. And I just hope that we're open to that would we be from a just through the local chair. law point of view? Um, so we are. I had to speak with Councillor Young last week. We are going to look at, I guess, like a stage two. So it, essentially what the trial was trying to... these Those signs that we trialled have been around for a long time. What we were trialling is a, a modified installation criteria to go back to the state to enable us to put them on more roads because they have mm. a criteria. <laughs> But what we're going to do is stage two of the trial where we're going to look at a non-regulatory sign as a sticker, as um, Deva has mentioned. Um, my concerns with the child picture is we could actually introduce some other issues, but maybe like a caricature, like with the active travel team um, and some wording is, but we can, that's, we, we're going to start that project now. So we can definitely have those discussions with you. Yep. Uh, and just lastly, Madam Chair, um, uh, when the road safety plan was initially tabled with Council, one of my aspirations for the body of work was a catalogue of road treatments that we could all use as local representatives so that if we have somebody, and I've talked about this at so many meetings, but if we have a resident who complains about um, speeding in their local road, at the moment, what I have to do is I have to look at the relevant policy, which I think is totally outdated from memory and, and needs reworking, renewal or whatever, and I've got to try and synthesise a reply by extracting some words out of that policy and to provide some feedback to the resident. What I would have liked to have seen, and maybe it's underway now, you can fill me in, is effectively a catalogue where if a resident has got a concern, I can go to some fact sheet and say, OK, you are complaining about X, Y, Z, here are some of the, the road treatments which may be available. It could be a chicane, it could be a breakout, it could be a, 
speed awareness device. Here are the eligibility criteria and here are some of the benefits and drawbacks. I've talked about it so often. I just wonder through you, Madam Chair, where are we up to with that body of work and is this something we can get done quickly? Yeah, so that's something we're currently working on and the way I see it as we've discussed is more of like a toolbox. So you've got a photo which is obvious of what the device is, some um, advantages, disadvantages and maybe some high level criteria that we assess against. Um, we're looking at putting that through um, council and we'd also like to put that on the forward facing website and do a lot of work around the communication side. So the road safety team are really great at that marketing and comms stuff, but the team I'm from, traffic engineers, we're not so good at that. And for example, I typed yellow line into our website the other day, it brought back nothing. And you guys would know how many requests we get about yellow lines. So there's no information on our forward facing website about yellow lines on how the community asks for them, why we would install them, why we would install them. Yep. So I'm doing a lot of work on some web content. I've also got three DL size fact sheets, which I may have mentioned to some of you in the past that I'm trying to finalise. And I've worded them on the front, it's like a did you know? and a little bit of education. And on the back, there's kind of like a self-assessment checklist. Um, so they can go, tick, like if it's about yellow lines, you know, is your street narrow? Um, are there other yellow lines in the street? Like the criteria that we assess against so that they, it's managing their expectations. And then a little blurb down the bottom saying, well, if you said no to some of the above, maybe you're not gonna get it. But if you wanna contact us, here's the traffic engineer's contact details. And then even a little spot for them to write their pathway number once they get it. Yep. And uh, Madam if, Chair, and no. just in closing, the, um, the, the speed awareness devices, I mean, I love the speed awareness devices. I think we all do. There's 104 of them in service, some of which I'm sure are coming to end of life. Um, again, not because I like praising the state in any way, but their speed awareness devices on the M1 seem capable of providing a response or driver feedback when there are multiple lanes. And at the moment, I'm constrained in my ability to deploy my divisional speed awareness devices because the road geometry requirements are so narrow that unless I've got like 60 metres or more of runway, and I'm dealing with a straight road and there's only a single lane, only if I've checked those things can I actually put a sign there. So, so my question is, with speed awareness devices, how soon will we have an opportunity to go to market to potentially secure another supplier that can allow us to deploy these devices in more places? Through the chair, if I could answer that quickly. Um, we've got, yes, you're right, we've got a 114-odd um, signs and a lot of them are, I won't say coming to the end of their life, but they're just out of warranty and they still have a lot of life left in them. So there's a bit of uh, electronics and mechanicals that has to happen in a pinching path from here and getting them to work. The thing we're looking at and we are talking to other councils, so there's four other councils that are operating under the same contract uh, with the same supplier. We're looking at the new generation, so we're on to the third generation of these sad signs. The next generation which, um, one of them is being trialed at Logan, is for a wildlife thing, short distance. It's on one lane, but we're looking at a multi-lane, so two lanes in one direction um, sort of signage. Uh, how it will distinguish, uh, you're right about the, the highway stuff, it does the inner two lanes. Uh, so we want them for the same thing. It may not be the same supplier, but it certainly be, it will be open to market. So when we come to the end of that contract, that will be something we'll be looking into. But having said that, um, the current signs that we have, and I know that, for a fact, I've worked on them, is uh, we can change the length so it's an entry speed and exit speed. So at the moment, it's on a defaulted, say, 90 metres to 200 metres. It picks you up there, reads you there, and somewhere displays a, a speed or some message. We are trying to get that shorter, so when you come into the windy, windy roads or certain areas, it picks you up earlier. Uh, whether it will or not, but it will display a message. So that's something we will probably do shortly as an operational thing. We can keep you up to speed on that. Councillor Taylor, did you have any other questions? Yep. Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. the Chair. Um, is, there, or is there an opportunity or how can we go about having these scooters or mobile devices not allowed in malls, but also around dining 
um, areas. So we've got a lot of outdoor dining and we have air, um, challenges of these scooters shooting up and down the road next to the dining area. And Orchid Avenue is a perfect example where we have scooter hire companies and we've got restaurants and, and they're actually um, heading down those paths. The ability just in certain areas to limit or um, stop them from actually operating in, in certain areas, particularly where we've got high usage pedestrian and um, outdoor dining areas and malls. Yeah, so under the um, Local 11, we can do that in the malls. Um, and there's also some uh, regulatory signage that TMR have produced that we can use. Um, yeah. yeah. So mine's in relation to um, the actual dining areas. Again, Orchid Avenue is in a mall, but it's a dining precinct where you've got restaurants, um, but you're, you're on the actual walk road side, but it's not an actual mall. So that's the area that... Yeah, through the chair, we can have a chat about that and look at some of the, yeah, the implications of if we do and don't do that in those areas from a connectivity perspective. Yep. Um, also, we spoke about, um, Councillor have also mentioned about um, geofencing and ability to actually have commercial operators have that geofencing or limiting on their device, on their um, whatever they hire out. So again, I'll use surface, but any area, if you're a commercial operator, how are we able to have the ability to put a limiting device on these scooters and also create a, a geofence around? I mean, if Brisbane, you can go around there and it's fully controlled. I know it's the, the device I think council provide, but is there a way that we can um, provide that to commercial operations? I'll answer, I'll answer that very quickly. That's just off the cuff, top of my head. Uh, we belong to that uh, personal mobility device forum managed by TMR based out of Brisbane. So I'll, I'll get that on, on the agenda for the next meeting, which is, I think is next month, to have a discussion about geofencing, not the Hyatt scheme, but the, the private Hyatt scooters. So um, interesting space. So we'll, I like that. Um, but to, clar to clarify, that would not be a council um, component, though. We wouldn't be no, able no, to do that. That would be a commercial a and state yeah. conversation, but which we can advocate for. Yeah, and it'd be great if we could drive that. <clears throat> and last question is, has there ever been any conversation about scooter, these devices being, um, uh, been having to be registra you know, registration and obviously fines enforced on the operator, no different to if you get a jet ski or a boat licence, um, you can still affect your current driving licence as well. Is there anything in that space that state government's looking at at the uh, moment? Yes and no. Uh, it's, I think they operate under the same rules as a, a bicycle or as a cycle, so you don't need a licence. Previously, if you're on the road riding, you would most likely have a driver's licence. Uh, in our case now, we've got young people who do not have any driver's license or any form of ID. So that's a conversation I think they're having on the side because it's, it is an issue for enforcement. Sorry, but it's something that they're constantly reviewing because these yes, devices yeah. are... Oh, look, I've seen some of, the, some of my son's mates flying in on yeah. these scooters. Did you report them? And they... I rang the police and they, <laughs> and they didn't even turn up. Um, but the point is, you've got young kids on scooters that they're allowed to ride around wherever they like. Um, and I'm just curious if that's something the state government's looking at monitoring at some stage. I, certainly, we can ensure that we can ask for an update at the next yep. meeting to see if we, we've got up-to-date information. I don't think it's any different, Councillor, to cyclists and registration of cyclists, which periodically comes up about the question as well. But we'll, we'll take that on notice. Councillor Patterson. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair. Um, I'm coming back to the question on enforcement, which I, I kind of find somewhat fanciful at the moment. Uh, I have a very close working relationship with the Southport Police Station, and I am clear they do not have five minutes a month to allocate to this. They just don't. I can't get 22 minutes a week for them to do a police beat in the CBD where they know it's essential because they don't have the time. You commented when there were questions about what enforcement's been done. Um, so I, I get that you haven't provided any details, but you've pr 
presented Brisbane. Brisbane's ratio of police per capita is significantly higher than here. So I, I just wonder whether there's... Uh, you, you, every time we come back to this, the answer is enforcement. We aren't going to get enforcement. What makes you confident that enforcement is going to be the answer? Because I, I, from where I sit and what I see what the police are doing right now, this is not going to happen, even if they could easily stop on the side of the road or... Yeah. yeah. Through the chair, very quickly. Yes, you, you are right. It is a resource um, issue for QPS. We, we have some... Our thing is signage and education. That's our, our role. And you can, you can educate someone to everything you've got. It's whether the person then takes it on. QPS, uh, and I think it's more the highway patrol guys that are doing it, but they have other, other priorities to worry about than pulling some kid on a bike. And I, I agree 100%. So we're in this difficult space of one resourcing. A lot of people are still on, a lot of police officers are still on leave. There's domestic violence, which is the number one agenda, as we all know, for police requirements. And road safety is down there because um, the odd person will get killed or seriously injured. But pulling some kid on a PMD not wearing his helmet is very low. So I agree with your thing. Um, they, they have, they have, we're working together. They're trialing things. But uh, it won't be Southport or Broadbeach or Kira or you know, police stations doing that. That may happen over time, but it's more working with uh, the police, the highway traffic branch uh, that are initiating that, doing the training on that. But uh, getting the, the feet, the boots on the ground to do the enforcement is another. It's a while, and we're all. The if, same I can, thing, I if I can add, Councillor. Um, through you, Madam Chair, it, it's a combination. It's, it's like, um, uh, same with um, cars on the road. It's a combination of enforcement, education, make sure the engineering's right, make sure the pavement marking's right. And uh, that's, that's one of the reasons why um, we will do our bit in terms of um, making sure that the engineering's right and we'll help them um, help the state and RECQ and the like with the education and the, uh, and the uh, marketing of what is safe, um, what, is, what is safe for the community um, in using these devices. But uh, that's one of the reasons why we've got the recommendation that the mayor actually write to the state because um, we need enforcement to do its bit and it's, it sits with the state and um, we just need to uh, make sure that they do, they do their bit um, and, uh, and provide the right um, enforcement as part of that, part of the bigger plan. Um, if I can, through you, Madam Chair. So um, um, just to add to that as well, one of the things we, um, we um, have been thinking about is how we provide additional data and reporting to provide that information to, to the state so that they can prioritise some of that enforcement if we do in the areas where we think it is highly likely. So utilising some of that, in, um, that, that AI um, crash analysis, potentially using CCTV as well as our, um, our SAD devices to actually start getting some of that data so we can actually say these are the places where it, it looks like that. So we can actually look at those and ask those to be prioritised prioritised when we are obviously looking at it, but ultimately, to, to Dale's point, um, the enforcement component is out of our hands and it is a combination of all of those things. With that, um, what I'm hearing consistently is really expensive, time-consuming things for the city to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, when we're told that the state's brought in fines and for police to do this. So, I mean, everything you just said then, that, that, that's a lot of resources that, again, we are allocating. Anyway. So, sorry, to clarify, we, we have a lot of that data already. So we, we have the CCTV footage, just that getting that data, packaging it up into a way that it's there. So it, it's not necessarily um, anything else additional. It's about how we utilise that data. Um, certainly, you know, there might be ways that people can report, you know, incidences and so forth as well so that we get other kind of collective data, but nothing that's too, in, you know, too annuous on the city. Councillor Young. Uh, thanks, Chair. I'll just try to stick with questions uh, because um, road safety and safety generally on our pathways is a very big issue for the whole community and I'm sure we all feel very frustrated about the lack of capacity to deal with a lot of problems. Uh, and I notice in this road safety report there's no mention of hooning and in my area, just as an indication of how diverse our city is, I've got no pathways. I'm trying desperately to put them in but I've got lots of hoons. Happy to swap with some people. Um, 
And I just wondered about the legislative changes that were being promoted through the state government about hooning and about enforcement of that. Where are we at? Can you tell me, please? Through the chair, I'll <coughs> give a, just a brief update. I deliberately did include, didn't include that on, the, on that report because I was new in the space, but it's our, our community service people who manage the hooning, the CCTV side. I'm involved more in the Intel side with the hooning, with, with the Logan background that I have. So it's the same relationships that have gone come through. So the hooning, uh, the hooning that are, uh, the police are targeting is in the small uh, streets that come out of Peck Pines Road and they, they scream the wheels and they go off. They're more after the large hooning, large groups, and we would have seen them on the yeah. news the last couple of days. So they're the ones they've been targeting. So they are... So it's a combination of a couple of different police districts working together. So what's coming out of Logan is coming to the northern Gold Coast. If they can chase them out of the Logan Gold Coast, they end up in Ashmore or down Robina Way or up your yeah, way. Yeah, no, I'm just and, wondering um, about the legislation. So they've been, it's very intel-based. It's very hungry on resources for QPS. And it's um, that information, the Hoon hotline is important, I think, uh, for residents to ring up because that gets through very quickly. Um, Councillor Vossi, you might be able to help me through your chair, because this was discussed last year, the state government was going to introduce new legislation to enable the um, enforcement of anti hooning yeah. laws against perpetrators, and we didn't have the capacity to no. provide any assistance. Our cameras aren't sufficient quality um, yeah. or resolution or anything like that to provide look, the information necessary. And look, to any media watching back the stream or streaming in, please heed my repeated pleas to you to keep me out of media coverage because it's come at a significant personal cost to me. Um, the state government did, after years of campaigning by this council and other councils, they did amend legislation to link the offence of hooning to the registered owner of a vehicle. But my understanding is that it was only for extremely high-range hooning events, uh, offence, offences, um, and, and I, again, I could be wrong, but I think only where there was an organised hoon meetup. So there was a case in Rubina on Friday. You, you might be aware of, um, where police were able to arrest, I think, up to 20 individuals, but only because there was an organised or advertised hoon meetup. Right. Uh, as far as as far as I know, the state government did not fully implement no, the, the laws as right. we were arguing for, yeah. which really is stupid on their part because what we're asking for is a harmonisation between the way in which speed tickets are issued and the way hoons carry on on our roads. Yeah. It, you know, it's up to the registered owner of a vehicle to be responsible for how that vehicle is used unless someone else is prepared to sign a stat deck. It's not rocket science. Ian Levers, the police union president, said if the state government were to adopt that approach, and I quote him here, it would be a silver bullet which would end hooning overnight. But the government has not yet taken up that act. And um, so to answer your question, I think publicly and through media statements, there has been a perceived reform to the legislation. Practically, though, I believe the reforms haven't delivered anything like we were asking for. Thank you. Uh, I think that's an important question to ask and be answered because um, my understanding too is that the government did look at it, got so far, but then it was realised it's a criminal, it, it creates a criminal act out of it and they didn't want us to do that and they pulled away from that promise. Um, something that we can control then, I've had wildlife, a couple of wildlife signs on order for about a year and um, these were budgeted for in 2022. 223 they were anticipated in a in a report that came to this committee for the implementation of yeah. or introduction of these signs in a couple of locations and I'm constantly on the back of the officer who's meant to be uh, monitoring this project or delivering the, the outcome and um, we're waiting for stuff to come from overseas it's ridiculous why can't we get a sign locally made or is there an ambition to change the contract about the delivery of those yeah, sorts yeah, of vehicle-activated signs. signs. So so through, through, through you, Madam Chair. If you just send it through to me, Peter, and I'll have a look at it. I'll have a look at the um, particular request. Okay. 
Um, in, sorry, if, if I can as well. Ultimately, I mean, obviously there's still supply chains with various things, yep. so yeah. it, it may be out of our control. If it's coming from overseas, I think it's no different, potentially, as, as we have issues with getting vehicles and plant and, and so forth. So it may be that, that that may be just the issue, but we'll take it on notice and, and confirm. It certainly is. That's what I've been advised by the officer. That's just waiting for the d delivery of these things, and once they're here, waiting for them to be installed. But and I'll bring that to your attention, Dale. Thanks for the offer. But there seems to be a, a problem with the supply. Why can't we get a local supply? Yep. Why does it have to come from the UK? I mean, we speak the same language. I think language. we're stuck with that contract, and that's. But I, I hear you. I'll Dale and I will follow that up with you outside. Then with the school cameras, I'm really in support of the states move to roll out the cameras at, in school zones and I yep. just wonder if there's um, an update coming to us about how that might be ramped up. We've got two in a pilot. I, I mean, in, I was in New South Wales driving around five years ago and they had them at everywhere. every school, everywhere, like even in the boondocks. Yep. And we were way behind. Yep. So I'm through interested the how chair, we Chair, I understand uh, once the trial it's halfway through the trial now. I understand that we, uh, we as councils, have an opportunity to recommend school locations where there is an existing school zone sign. For uh, we've got a lot of those. Yep, we've got a lot of we've got a lot of school <coughs> zone areas, but we only have uh, two two speed cameras. Right. It's a state. It's a state. So you're saying that we can nominate? We can. Yeah, we can apply for that. <laughs> okay, I'll do that. Um, I could come back to this 50k in this, my street thing, uh, and I'll just briefly touch upon it. it. In my opinion, it was just a really great opportunity lost. It was never intended to be a 50k in my street. The idea with nurtured, uh, the, the nub of it was just to have a message on people's bins that slow down in my street. Just something simple, very personal, but broadcast and something I want to own and adopt and say, slow down in my street because I'm sick of you speeding. Yeah. And it became this complex technical engineering thing where then it became a 50k sign, which is a regulatory sign, <coughs> and could yeah. only, only be applied by authorised personnel to yeah. the bin. Then we had to get like traffic controllers in to safe... You can it, we had to get traffic controllers in at cost to safeguard the people applying the stickers to the bin. They can only be, be put into certain streets, obviously the 50, because, but then there's problems, you know, you might move and take your bin and now you're in a 60k zone, you've put your 50 bin out. <laughs> it was just bizarre. Yeah, traffic, I'm not kidding. And um, only in certain speeds where you had certain volume of traffic and the problem was those, those little streets were the, where the real problem was because they didn't have enough traffic to, to um, support or warrant a safety sign being so, in, installed, just a really complex solution to something that was seemingly simple and I'll continue to pursue this. I've had a discussion with Renee and Devon last week and uh, that's positive and I intend to push into that so that we can have a rollout that people adopt and own themselves and that they all universally get behind and they don't just, they're not just spectators in an episode. Um, and so, sorry, if I could uh, quickly respond to that, please, Councillor, through, through you, Madam Chair. So, um, uh, absolutely taken on notice, there is a, um, a psychology behind messaging that should be applied to that, which, um, and I think we've had some examples with potentially pictures of children that we will, there are experts in this field, and, and we will take that on notice, and we will come back with some suggestions which are based, um, you know, it's certainly not the first area to consider utilising signs in this way. So, we'll leverage that experience and bring that back. Thanks, Director. And, um, Chair, I wonder if you might entertain, when we get to it, a change to the motion, because it talks about, in number two, councillors engage as part of the next phase of the pathway safety study. I thought this was all about road safety um, yeah. three report. Well. You know, it's a Cold Coast road safety plan, so I thought we should be reflecting that in our resolution and recommendations More than happy to, to come back to the resolution once I've given everybody else an opportunity. Yeah. So, thanks, Peter. Um, Councillor Caldwell, did you have any comments or any questions? Councillor Gates? Uh, thanks, Chairman. I just wanted to ask through you, Chair, to the officers. At Coomera Waters, we have a walkway that has been problematic. It's a public access easement over private property. So it's waterfront land that has a public walkway access way between the 
rear backyard and the waterfront. It's on the title of each of the properties, but it's it was approved as an easement to council during the development application. And on that walkway, um, we have signage that indicates what can and can't occur on the walkway, together with the opportunity to issue a fine uh, to users who are found not to be using that pathway in accordance with the signage. And there's no amount indicated on the signage because it changes every year with the adoption of our fees and charges. But my question is, if we can do that there, why can't we do it where we're having all of the problems uh, on the ocean way? Silence. Everyone's looking at silence, aren't they? <laughs> um, th through you, Manchette. So um, we um, we are actually having a talk to the health and reg regulatory area about potentially if there is a local law that we could potentially rely on um, in terms of some of this. But ultimately, um, road comes under QPS, and, I, and we'll have to check and understand if there is a difference between the easement component and the, and a footpath. But that's one of the things that we we should look at to see if there is compliance activity that we could look into. Um, Are you saying the ocean way is called a road? That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Parts of it are. Yeah. yeah. Right, OK. So, that, so, so that's the reason, for example, that TMR have the speed limits. They set the speed limits as well for the 12 on, on the pathway. Anything else, Councillor no. Gates? Councillor Owen Jones with the new haircut. Thank you. Um, I don't actually have any questions, but I'll keep it brief. I reckon the Ocean Way, if we extended it, we would spread out the number of users. <coughs> We're taken on on That's note. Yes. Send where? Um, the the missing the missing link from Nobby's North to anywhere. Nob yep. Broadbeach. That's what yep. it's called. Los Angeles Boulevard. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So um, uh, um, just quickly um, through you, Madam Chair, so um, there are a couple of components within the um, the full ocean way which are actually being looked at. Um, so. So, thank you. So, through um, Burley to North Burley, um, there is a proposal to widen the path there. Um, and obviously, as part of light rail stage three, um, there is an expectation that the ocean way is completed as part of that. And there's an opportunity to specify, depending on the width of the road corridor, where that actually goes and how big that would be. So, some of that can be future proofed where we can. Councillor Hamill. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, I had a question about the Crash Investigation Alliance and um, it's around, I have found it a little bit hit and miss on when I actually get reports of crashes that have occurred and what the investigation has found. I've had to on occasion go chasing them and then I've, and sometimes it's because it wasn't a threshold where officers thought they needed to report it through to me. So the question was, is there a chance to improve maybe the internal policy around what councillors receive back from the investigation and what format it comes in so that when we attend those community meetings and PNC meetings and whatnot and someone brings up a, a crash that occurred, we've got that information available to us um, of how we might improve that process and improve the format we get that detail in. Yep. And I think on that too, and I would agree with you on that, it's just whether it's driver error, whether it's been a weather-related thing, whether it's been um, a medical incident, things like that, so that when you go to those meetings and they say, council's not doing their job, well, actually, that wasn't a councillor error. It was a council, it was a blah, blah, blah. Mm. Without giving out any personal details, we've had a lot of that in Division 12 schools. No, to, to I don't think I've ever received any report from any city officer regarding a motor vehicle accident. I haven't, in, like, unless I've requested it, like when a child's been hit on the crossing or when an old lady's crashed into three cars in Burley. Um, or if yeah. you're looking to put signals in and you yeah. ask for a crash history. But yeah. As a random, I've never had one in all those years that I've been around. Oh. <laughs> 24, 24 years, we heard you 24, say that. yeah. But, yeah. So, 
I can only talk to the yeah. fact that I have had a couple and they weren't where I've requested them. It was just that a, a crash occurred where QPS and, and ambulance had to arrive. We expect you to probably get questions about it. Here's some information, which I thought that's brilliant. But there's, there's obviously no internal formal policy around it of what the threshold is of where an investigation occurs and something coming to councillors. So it might be an opportunity to look at that um, as something to include. And the second question in that same idea of the format the information is provided in to being available to the community or being disseminable to the community easy is around the speed awareness device data. So we get that quarterly update where you'll get a PDF sheet through for each of the devices and then some councillors choose to put it all up in one hit, others break it into a table to put out, but there's no single point of contact where the community can go looking for that. Like, it's information you give to us to put out there, just put it on the web, forward-facing website for them to see and we can direct them there. Um, or in the mapping system, we can see where an investigation has occurred, but is there just somewhere we could easily look up the history instead of having to go back through a dozen PDF sheets to work out what the trend has been and whatnot. Again, keeping community updated and that education piece, we get some great data from it, just a, a better format or a better process or some different ideas about how we can use that information a bit more effectively. Yep. Through, through you, Madam Chair, absolutely. I think um, Renee, Renee has already mentioned we, we really want to start focusing on how we get this information better out to the community and, and the assessment of, the, of our website as one of our tools that we should be using as a channel for this stuff. It, it's not there, so it's absolutely a focus for the team about how we start to do some better campaigning and marketing and also using that data in a more effective way. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor. Just to add, uh, Madam Chair, with the crash investigations, um, we I hope to improve that that advisory process. So uh, in my previous roles, what we did was, what I did was um, when I got notified of a crash, which is any time of the day, I would normally uh, email the councillor involved saying, look, heads up, been a crash involved, X and Y were involved, police think this is the, this, these were the reasons. I would then have some further information probably the next working day saying it was speeding, drink driving, police chase, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. That'll give you a heads up when you go to your community, when you get your Facebook and your socials saying, uh, and that's what I, it's one of the things I want to improve. Chair, uh, Chair, that was exactly what I got. And it's, it's only was a couple of occasions, I have to admit, I think it was in the first year of office, but that's what I got. And then those occasions, I wasn't aware of the accident. And then exactly as the officers put it, someone asked a question on Facebook or at the next community meeting, it came up and I wasn't surprised by it. And I could offer some information back that was accurate and the community really appreciated it. So if, if that's coming, that would be fantastic. It'll only be initially for the fatal yeah. crashes yeah. or the very serious injuries where there's imminent death or something like that, yeah. like a motorcycle thing where we know it's gonna happen. So. Yeah, that, that, through, you, through you, Madam Chair. That was the uh, temper of caution. I was just going to add, um, we, we typically only get um, that level of detail where the forensic crash unit are actually on site and um, which are typically yeah. the, the fatals and the, and the serious injuries. For the, um, the more minor um, um, bingles, um, we don't get that data until much later in the piece. Sometimes it'd be, it'd be months. months, yeah. yeah so, or we, we can get the state network as well. We can get well. the state network, yeah. but we'd, yeah. yeah. So, Chair, I understand that the, the fatality, like that's the extreme end, and I'm not talking about where there's a little, little ding, but, um, like ones where there's been a T-bone or a major deflection where someone's been hospitalised, I think was the threshold that was, I guess I had in my head, if someone's ended up in hospital because of it, forensics may not come to it, but QPS and QAS have gone there. It should end up in the history, and I'm not sure what agency controls that history, but it ends up in there at some stage. Yeah, yeah. Um, just that. There's a threshold, whatever it is, but you get it. We can, Thanks, we can talk offline and talk you through the process. Councillors, I think that's probably exhausted all the Q&A. Um, I will go back to Councillor Peter Young, who had suggested a change Thanks, to the Chair. recommendation. Um, I'll wait till I can see the screen. Uh, so I just propose that we might change number two. So it says the councillors engage as part of the further um, development of the pathway state safety study and road safety plan. Are engaged as further engagement. Um, no, are engaged in further development of.
the road safety plan and just get rid of part of the next phase. No, not all of that. Yeah, I'm trying to deal with them separately. Yeah, get rid of those words, thanks. Road safety plan and the pathway safety study to develop further treatments to improve safety of all, all, road, all users. Yeah, that's it. And take out the as further engagement, right? Yeah, that's right. Are engaged in further are development. Further engaged. You've got two engaged there, see? So, so delete take out, no, as further bit. engagement. No, no, delete no, as, as further as engagement. engagement. Councillors are engaged in further Thanks, the road safety plan and the pathway safety study to develop further treatments to improve safety for all users. Yep, that's two. What happened to number one? That was easy. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> Councillor Patterson. Um, thank you. Well, I um, I'd support Councillor Young's uh, amendment, and I've got a suggestion for part three, um, that the Mayor writes to the Premier of Queensland and the Minister of Transport and Main Roads to request specific commitments on compliance action. He can't change his motion. He has to change his motion if he agrees with you, but otherwise you have to do another amendment. I'm just saying that I've got another amendment on... On compliance action for the GC's shared paths. And if you're okay with it, you can put it through. Yes, it's I'm just happy. so that there's something, rather than, oh, yeah. you give us some kind of compliance action, I mean, it's just zero. Mm. So we're saying we'll get a specific commitment from them. Yep. So, um, Councillor Young, you're happy with that? I'm happy that? with that. We yeah. still need number four, please. Okay, and number four is still there. Yep. Yeah, leave that there. Thank you. So, councillors, could we all have a read of that um, amendment? And that's what moved like by... Do, Chair, I'd like you to have a read of the amendment. Make sure that you're OK with it. And then it's been moved by Councillor Peter Young and seconded by Councillor Patterson. Are you all in favour of what is there on the screen? Yep. And I'll foreshadow further amendment. <laughs> Pass. He's being naughty. <laughs> All right, um, councillors, we have a, a uh, amended motion up there on the screen. I don't uh, think I need to speak to it, but I'm happy to if you want, Chair. I mean, okay. obviously, we're dealing with a whole yeah. range of issues that affect us all in our communities, and the more input we can have into this evolving mm. um, planning yeah. and, and implementation for the safety of the community, the better, I think. Thanks, Councillor Thanks. Young. And Councillor Patterson, you're happy there? Um, uh, colleagues, I'm going to put that to the vote. All those in favour? That. All those in favour? That's great. That's carried unanimously. Um, is there any general business items today? Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. Uh, oh, meeting closed, 14.25. <laughs> 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 Thanks, everyone.